associate professor from the Oakland University Department of History. His name is DeWitt Dykes, and he joins us now in the Oakland County Megacast. Mr. Dykes, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. How are you? How's your how's your team over at Oakland? Say that again. How are you? How's your how is your team over at Oakland doing? Well, we're all doing well. We're in uh, exile, or or shit. Uh, there's another word for it. In uh, what? Isolation. Isolation. Yes. Yes. Well, well, it's good to hear that you're doing all right. Uh, we we're living in some very historic times right now. A lot of important moments going on that we're going to be learning from in the future and hopefully that we can get through by learning from our past as well in particular i think the most one of the most profound if not the most profound historical moment that we're currently going through is the black lives matter movement is is really hitting its stride right now and i think it's starting to generally with, with the masses here in the united states take hold and people are taking the messages seriously um, you were also involved in the civil rights movement and the marches of the 1960s. In what ways do you see a comparison or a, and some contrasts between the civil rights movement of the 1960s and the Black Lives Matter movement of our modern days? Well, they are similar in that the Black Lives Movement as well as the civil rights movement each addressed what was considered to be a major problem of the time, and it employed a method of trying to publicize and attack it and try to dismantle the problem and improve the situation for that time. And each had some success according to what happened. Uh, and what many people don't realize is that the civil rights movement, as they call it, uh, went on from the early 1900s down to uh, the 1970 at least, for example. And it had small victories, small changes, uh, over periods of time, and so the Black Lives Movement is having the same thing. When it first uh, came out and started using that slogan, people didn't understand it. Uh, at least many people didn't. Un many Black people did, uh, but many whites used the phrase, oh, all lives matter, but they didn't understand the distinction, and so the George Floyd case, several other cases we could numerate, et cetera, have now given it a new life, but especially also the uh, Eman the murders at the Emanuel AME T uh, Church in, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. That played a very significant role, totally unprovoked assault on African Americans to start what the man thought was gonna be, quote, a race war. And so that plus the George Floyd and many other uh, problems when the African Americans have been unjustly attacked and et cetera, have given the Black Lives Movement a, um, a new lease and a new vision. And so even many whites now are using uh, the symbols and the signs of Black Lives Matter to help publicize the desire for some degree of equality, a much greater degree. And, and on that note, the, the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, as it's, as it's being referred to in today's times, and just the phrase Black Lives Matter, you alluded to at, at first when it was first being used several years ago, that the reaction from the white community, from, or, from, or at least a significant portion of white people that responded to that saying all lives matter. And there is a difference in that because Black Lives Matter isn't simply saying that that black lives matter more than any other life it's saying that they matter in general and and that there are inequities in this society that need to be addressed to take that to heart and when people are saying all lives matter they're not only taking away from that argument they're actually making a counter argument that's really unproductive from a historical standpoint what is the significance negatively of all lives matter of the all lives matter mantra countering Black Lives Matter and, and what positive changes that are necessary in this society that the movement is trying to make? Well, basically, it's a refusal to see the uniqueness of what happens to blacks on a very routine situation. Uh, the George Floyd situation, the situation in Atlanta that came right after it, it's almost as if the police in Atlanta never heard of George Floyd, never heard of what happened. Uh, and didn't have, hear about what happened in South Carolina about a man who was shot six times because he was trying to run away after being stopped for a broken taillight. So what Black Lives Matters and other similar kinds of things are trying to say is 
blacks don't receive a degree of respect as human beings that they ought to receive. It's that simple. And that it's different. Uh, occasionally a white person gets badly treated, such as the white man, I think in Buffalo, New York, who was knocked down, but they didn't kill him. Not that that has to be done, but he was disrespected and mistreated for no reason whatsoever. And it does happen to some whites, but it happens more routinely to blacks. It and does. And usually, right. usually with no um, remedies or no, or no remedies or very little punishment. It does, and, and, it, and the evidence shows that, the statistics show that, and, hi and history shows that as well. And, and that's what this movement is partially fighting for, is to obviously make that tragic outcome that happens so continuously in our society be done away with and be more equitable. But uh, it's also to reorganize the, and, and, and to rethink the way that we approach law enforcement and um, policing our communities and we've seen a lot of uh, arguments being made to defund the police and a lot of arguments being made to reform the police and those arguments have validity uh, because of historical significance of the police in a lot of these black communities can you touch on that a little bit about the differences historically that we have seen in policing of predominantly black communities versus predominantly white communities well until recently in large cities, even medium-sized cities and others where there were large numbers of blacks and whites, uh, most blacks looked upon the police as a kind of occupying army. And now that police have won throughout the nation the right not to have to live in the places where they work, them even more of an occupying army, a group of people who come into work and to beat them up uh, to mistreat them, to assume that any accusation is a serious uh, crime that they've committed and that any black skin is something that has to be investigated, uh, for example. And so many blacks still look upon them as an occupying army and realize that even though there are many individual officers in many circumstances where they do good, occasionally you hear about an officer who helps to deliver a baby of a woman who's on her way to the hospital or, or some other uh, save a life or somewhat other. And occasionally in the community policing, some people, some officers are friendly and make and use their connections with the, with the community to help solve crimes. But too often we keep hearing about situations where officers get confused and they're called to see if someone's all right and wind up treating the person as if they are a uh, robbery, uh, burglary, killing them. And so that happens too often and it's very unfortunate. Uh, I heard you or someone mentioned the, the, um, <clears throat> the, 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 the uh, Juneteenth celebration that's coming up this yes. weekend and the observance at the theaters I think a lot of people don't fully understand about either the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment and the circumstances under which the slaves became free. And uh, greater recognition of Juneteenth is, is one of the things that can help improve race relations. Unfortunately, a lot of white people think, well, slavery was a long time ago. I didn't have anything to do with it. And in many cases, my family had nothing to do with it. And so there's no need to think about it. But it is a situation in which, first of all, uh, almost 4 million people were still enslaved when the Civil War started, almost 4 million. Of those people, most of them were born in the United States of America after the slave trade was cut off in the early 1800s. And Many of many whites in general thought that the Africans were inferior. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, as president, about 1915, referred to uh, a host, H O S T, of dusky children put out of school too soon. And what he meant by that is somehow slavery was supposed to be civilizing these Africans and making them better human beings, and that it ended too soon. And this, of course, is roughly, uh, what is it, 40, 
45 and 60 years after slavery was over. He's saying they were put out of school too soon. And so that attitude that Africans in general are inferior, uh, persons of African descent are inferior, has come down to the present time in various ways. It's much more subtle as opposed to as open as it was uh, under the Woodrow Wilson administration. But we still have the assumption of inferiority. Low income status is considered a form of inferiority. And there's the assumption that if African Americans were equal to whites, they'd work hard and become economically equal to whites. So uh, anyway, we have these things. And many people don't understand the significance of the Emancipation Proclamation, that it didn't free all the slaves and it didn't cover all of the states where slavery uh, was legal. So the Juneteenth celebration that's coming up this weekend is a celebration to observe the final and ultimate end of slavery. Uh, the 13th Amendment is what finally made slavery totally illegal uh, throughout the country as an institution and a practice. Of course, uh, some slave owners tried to keep uh, the slaves there as long as possible. Uh, and the, um, the most important thing that could help African Americans and low income people in general is to improve the economy so there are better jobs, better health care, better pensions, et cetera. It's terrible that the coronavirus has made low income people and people dependent upon working every day virtually in, in greater poverty than they were before, mm -hmm. that they have few jobs and few little income and no, uh, no backup. And it's terrible that the national government has not increased the, uh, the opportunity for low income people to enroll in some form of health care. Instead, they are so committed to getting rid of health care for working class and low income people that they have just refused it and act as if it's their problem, so to speak. So we need to have a better economy. Uh, we need to have more benefits, health care, uh, pensions, uh, unemployment insurance. We need to have that for all persons at every level, regardless of their job. We need it for not only people who have steady work in normal times, but people who uh, have uh, part-time work and who are trying to raise families and persons who uh, have what sometimes people call gig work, who work by the job as opposed to having a steady stream of income. So we need a, we need a lot of improvements. We're joined by DeWitt Dykes, associate professor of, of uh, at the Oakland <laughs> University Department of History. My apologies for that. I stumbled a little bit. DeWitt right. Dykes, associate professor at the Oakland University Department of History with us on the Oakland County Megacast and ma making great points uh, about the abolition of slavery and the true abolition of slavery because the Emancipation Proclamation was a stopgap and historically speaking with the context behind it, Abraham Lincoln didn't entirely want to free enslaved people. It was a strategy to, that significantly helped the Union Army win the Civil War and the 13th Amendment took away the allowance of slavery, of slavery and did legally abolish slavery but didn't take away those contextual and continuous systemic racism, uh, points of system systemic racism in our society that still exists today. And that's what we're seeing in this context today of the Black Lives Matter movement. And with that being said, uh, Professor Dykes, the communication is definitely d in place. We're seeing oftentimes the uh, powers that be, whether it be municipal leadership, whether it be law enforcement leadership, or it be state and federal leadership communicating with leadership in the protests and in the movement, opening up conversations, considering different changes. Are you seeing better progress? Are we seeing better progress right now than we have in the past when we've had incidents occur, tragedies occur, and protests begin similar to the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020? Is it having a greater effect now and is more positive change coming from this current iteration of the movement and this current momentum, better yet, of the movement than in the past? Well, temporarily. At the present time, we have 
greater public attention. Unfortunately, the video showing uh, uh, George Floyd with the policeman on his neck is saying, I can't breathe. The other policemen on his back are watching and doing nothing to try to make sure he lived so he could go to jail and find out if he really is guilty of some sort of a crime. But they killed him without any effort to determine if he was really guilty. He was accused but never proven guilty. And the video makes it so clear. Now, uh, Eric Garner in uh, New York was killed in a similar fashion, and there was some video, but it didn't seem to arouse the same kind of public attention and persistence. And so um, we hope that this will be a longer term concern and a broader examination of social relationships and a greater desire to get something done on a broader scale. The degree to which it persists, that is the interest in making changes. Right now, they're considering more changes other than trying to make police just a better group of people, but trying to realize that there's some cases where you need social workers or other kinds of persons with other skills. And you might even need to hire some social workers to be policemen to send them out at certain times or persons with those skills. Unfortunately, uh, the police are usually hired for combat uh, and former army people and other uh, armed forces people are often hired for, for that, for example. And then, uh, and many of them have been trained to be combat warriors in some place like Iraq or some other place overseas. So instead of, they have trouble looking upon their fellow citizens as per persons who need to be considered uh, with some degree of, of, of politeness, concern, and try to make sure there's a real reason. And then if you watch the indictment of the police in Atlanta, they did not tell Mr. Uh, I forget his name right now. They did not tell him he was under arrest. Mm -hmm. They did not even say you're under arrest. And he cooperated with them for a minute, 40 minutes or more and then when they tried to physically restrain him, he resisted. And whether he should have not is not the issue. They never said, you are under arrest, put your hands behind your back. That's what they should have said. They never did. Training. And, so they're yeah, and, and training and reform is hopefully going to, in, in part, address that. But th there's a greater issue at hand that, that is what this movement is pushing to raise awareness for and to make change for. DeWitt Dykes, associate professor at the Oakland University Department of History. Just a couple more minutes with you, and I'd just like to ask you about this as well. We've seen a lot of calls to take down statues, to remove names from institutions of historical figures that have very murky or, or frankly, inhumane <laughs> pasts uh, throughout our country. And it's making some momentum. We're seeing statues all throughout the world, really, being taken down, including a Christopher Columbus statue in, De in Detroit as well in recent times. Some would argue that's erasing history. I, I'm not in that camp, and I, I, I still see the historical significance of those figures, regardless of if there's a statue or not, or if their name's on a wall. Is removing these statues removing their history, or is it putting their history in a different context that's more productive with what we know today? You said it beautifully. It's not removing history, but putting it in a better context. And statutes belong in museums, perhaps in some other places. Uh, but the places they've been put in is to give them honor. And we need to give them less honor and to evaluate their actual role in history. And we have statues to people who helped decimate the Native Americans, for example. Uh, and whether we should have such a statue is a question. It might be that we need a little more analysis, but, but persons who are associated with uh, decimating the Native Americans with racial segregation, with, racial, with slavery, et cetera, et cetera, then uh, we don't need to memorialize these people as opposed to, uh, we have history books, we have other places, and in places like Virginia, they do have a, a museum of the Confederacy. 
And there's nothing wrong with having a museum of the Confederacy to show how wrong they were and what, how, how, how uh, organized they were and their attitudes. But what we do need to do is to get rid of this idea that the Confederates uh, weren't trying to preserve slavery because that was the primary thing they were trying to do. Right. But some people don't seem to realize that the Confederate flag equals dedication to keeping people in slavery. The Confederate flag means a dedication to keeping people in slavery and to rebelling against civility and treating other people with equality. That's what this Confederate flag is. And then you have all sorts of monuments uh, and the community should agree on which monuments to keep and which ones to get rid of. And what the monuments don't have to be totally destroyed, but put in a different place where they, their significance of the person involved can be accepted. And just like museums have, have uh, and art museums especially have a wide variety of items in their collection, they can be kept and be observed and be taught. This is what some people used to memorialize and idealize and, and et cetera, but we don't do that anymore. And this is why. And so they can be used for teaching, but get them out of places where uh, it appears that they're trying to say whatever they did was wonderful. They kept people in slavery. They hounded the Native Americans. They killed and decimated Native Americans. They took their land, et cetera, et cetera. It's as if all that's fine. Well, thank you very much for being with us today, Profe Associate Professor DeWitt Dykes from Oakland University's Department of History. I appreciate you being with me today. All right, and hope you have a uh, happy Juneteenth this weekend. You as well. Thank you very much, Professor. Associate Professor DeWitt Dykes from Oakland University's Department of History with us on the Oakland County Megacast.